Well, welcome everyone uh, back to our daily devotions. Uh, we're so glad that you're with us. And I just wanted to start by uh, thanking those who have, uh, who have written to me personally or contacted me about uh, all that has uh, been going on with these devotions uh, the past, really, I think about six weeks we've been doing them. Um, and I want to let you know that uh, it's not a one-man show. I'm thankful for the team that helps put this together. And we're glad to be able to bring this to you. And I've been waiting to, uh, to really un un unveil this. Um, and I feel now is a good time. Uh, we're going to spend our, our next batch of devotions going through the book of Revelation. And sometimes it will correlate with our written devotion that comes out uh, first thing in the morning. And sometimes it won't. But we'll make sure when you come here for the video devotional, we'll have some content on the book of Revelation. And I think that's for, for good reason. Um, and so I've titled today's devotion, you, you'll see it now, is this the end of the world? Um, our recent events surrounding the origins and the outbreak of COVID-19 have produced really a paralyzing panic across the world. And sometimes when you look at all of the media, all of the attention this has gotten, and obviously we need to be vigilant. We need to do our due diligence and do our part, medically and spiritually speaking. But it's quite obvious that fear is perhaps the, the real danger here. And sometimes uh, that could cause even the strongest of believers to question, to doubt their faith. And so no matter where you stand in your walk with God, what you need to know is that when it comes to the end of the world, COVID-19 uh, is not necessarily uh, gonna usher in the second coming of Christ. Uh, we are not in the, the great tribulation, uh, but we are right where God wants us right now in this point of history. And in order to understand not only the current crisis that we're in, but really uh, all that's to come, it's important that we frame it through the book of Revelation. And so we're, we're going to just uh, pick apart these chapters and share uh, what God has here for us, um, but we want it to truly be an encouragement uh, to you. Um, you know, the book of Revelation is a marvelous uh, construction, a marvelous piece of spiritual literature. And it really is the only uh, New Testament book that was communicated by angels to a human author. And so uh, there's a lot of beauty that's in this book. And it's not just for the purpose of understanding the end times, but the book of Revelation, as you go through it, is a reminder and really a warning for the church, all believers, concerning sin. Um, something that's not talked about enough in our modern day of church, but the book of Revelation reminds us to steer clear of sin. It's also a reminder of the pursuit of God's holiness and how very important that'll be, obviously, in glory. It's a reminder of the strength, the, the incredible, the, the unmatched strength of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, it's a reminder that we will overcome the devil, um, that there is nothing that a believer should fear based on reading through the book of Revelation. And so um, I've had the joy of uh, going through the book of Revelation myself, and I actually brought up here my, uh, my scripture journal, which has all my notes of the book of Revelation, my recent notes of them. Um, and so I've broken down the book of Revelation really into three sections. I think chapter one focuses on really the, the glory of Christ, um, and we'll get into that in this first chapter. Chapter two and three, uh, gives us the seven churches, and we'll get into who those churches are and what Jesus' specific message was to those churches and why it is applicable to the church today. And, you know, this is, this is really a wealth of information that we could apply to our lives, spiritually speaking. Um, and then, of course, uh, from chapters 4 then to 22 to the end of the book of Revelation, you have the future plans as they pertain to Christ and his second coming. All that's involved with the tribulation, uh, all that's involved with the Antichrist, all the different judgments that God unleashes upon, allows to be unleashed upon the earth. Now, through it all, we must realize something very, very important. And we'll get to this a little bit later on um, in these devotions down the line. Uh, but it, it, it's clear, and it's okay if you have a different view of this, but when I study the book of Thessalonians, when I go back into the book of Daniel, when I look at Matthew 24 and 25, and I look at one of Jesus' specific promises to the churches here, the seven churches in Revelation, um, it appears to me that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, 
you will be spared of the tribulation, the seven years of wrath that God will pour out upon the earth that will be raptured, taken up to heaven. Um, and we don't have to worry about all those things that sometimes people worry about. We'll get into timelines and the specifics of that. But again, it ties back to this understanding of the book of Revelation. Now, why the title Revelation? Um, that's, a, that's a good question to ask. Um, I, the title Revelation means to unveil. And really what the entire scriptures are, you know, revealing God and, you know, obviously uh, alluding to the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. Revelation is really just a full out blown revelation of Jesus Christ. And, you know, think about it this way as well. You know, the four gospels portrayed Christ in, in really in a, in a humiliation state, going to the cross, um, even going back further than that, the Son of Man had no place to lay his head. Go back even further than that to his birth, being born in a dark, dirty, stinky cave. Um, and so nothing but humiliation, the king of glory subjected to, to this earth, subjected to the courts of this earth, uh, mistreated. We know all about the crucifixion. So the gospels portray the humiliation of Christ, whereas the book of Revelation gives us very clearly the honor of Christ. And it really is a, a, a beautiful symphony as you begin to uh, digest the book of Revelation. Also, the book of Revelation, although there is no direct quote to the Old Testament, out of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, 278 of them refer or allude to prophecy in the Old Testament. Remarkable. And so yeah, you begin to look at the book of Revelation and you begin to get just hopeful just with these opening verses. And so why don't we just dive in and look at the first two verses, and then we'll come back and take a look at the uh, verse three, and then we'll just stop there for today. Um, but right here, I'm going to be reading out of the, uh, the English uh, Standard Version, uh, but in Revelation chapter one, starting in verse one, uh, the author is the Apostle John. We'll talk about him in just a second. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, so the unveiling of Jesus Christ, in other words, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must take place soon. Now, we'll just stop here just for a second because we need to explain a few things. First of all, uh, the word servants, doulos, uh, those who are willing servants, and obviously John is one of them. You know, John really had a, a profound love for Jesus. John was the youngest of the disciples. John was the only disciple, the only apostle that didn't desert Jesus at the cross. All of the other apostles have been martyred. At this juncture in history, John is approaching triple digits, nearly 100 years of age. He's been banished to the island of Patmos by the Roman Caesar Doamission. And he's been left there. And usually the island of Patmos and the cave where John was was reserved for political prisoners and those who posed the threat. And, uh, you know, listen, they tried to kill John numerous times. And God in his infinite mercy and perhaps a reward, and this is my belief, and it doesn't tell you this exactly in the Bible, but my belief is that John was rewarded for not deserting Christ. And John is given the privilege to write the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And so uh, as marvelous as the resurrection is, um, and it is the centerpiece of our faith, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the second coming really is about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, you know, you look at it this way, and John was blessed, the servant, to record all of these things. And so then it goes on to say, as we just read, to take place soon. Now, did that mean that, it was going to happen the next day after John wrote this. Well, John was hoping it would, but he's not saying that it was. He's not implying that it's going to happen tomorrow. He had a hope that the return of Christ was going to happen tomorrow. Uh, but this phrase right here in the Greek language, soon to take place, isn't speaking about it's going to, you know, soon to take place, going to happen at one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. It's talking about that the season, when it happens, that it will happen rapidly, um, that things will unfold. So, uh, you know, once the rapture happens, the clock, the seven years of tribulation that is prophesied about in Daniel, in Ezekiel, and obviously told here in the book of Revelation, that is going to happen. The judgments are going to happen 
uh, consecutively, and nothing is going to be able to stop them. They're going to happen. Not even all the forces of evil could stop them. And so that's what that's what is being referred to here. Going on here now, it says, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. Now, tying this together, the revelation of Jesus Christ, God gave Jesus the mission. We are to continue the mission of Jesus. And Jesus let the mission be known to his disciples, spreading the gospel. And John now, again, uh, concludes himself in this bunch that uh, the angel came and gave the message. As I said at the top, the book of Revelation is the only New Testament literature here, the only New Testament book that an angel communicated to a human author. Um, And so uh, this is really a a marvelous occurrence. And then it says this in verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Now, you know, I think this um, obviously encompasses the ministry of Jesus Christ. And you have to realize John is, again, approaching 100. He's on the island of Patmos. His traveling days are over. Um, no, no hope of getting away from here. And the prisoners that are there, they've become his church. And church history reveals that, uh, that, that the people that were in prison with John on the island of Patmos, they became followers of Christ. And John was their pastor. John kept pastoring until he died. You don't retire from the pastorate. One way, wherever God puts you, if you get old, one day I get old, they throw me in a nursing home, uh, that'll be my church. I'll be pastoring there. So wherever you are, you're serving. And John, this servant, um, and so he's speaking here of the revelation, the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's John who writes in his epistle in 1 John, says that we heard him, we saw him, we touched him. Uh, we make this known to you to make our joy complete. It ties in with that same verbiage there. And then uh, we we drop right here at this verse two here uh, just to highlight um, a few important factors here of the of the book of Revelation as well. Um, you know, most likely some people go, who's the angel that's communicating with John? Um, I got my money on Gabriel. Um, I think Gabriel is a great, I obviously have the archangel Michael, and we're going to learn about angels in the, in the book of Revelation as well. Uh, there's a, a hierarchy of angels. There's specific angels that are around the throne. There are specific angels that are giving messages. I think it's I think it's it's reasonable to believe this is Gabriel because it's Gabriel who came to Mary, and it's Gabriel who gave the the announcement of the first coming of Christ. And I think Gabriel is on that that detail of God. And so whether it's you know Gabriel or Michael or another high-ranking angel, um, that really is um, an ancillary fact. Um, but most likely, it's Gabriel. And John is a great candidate for the book of Revelation to write it as an eyewitness. He saw these things. So there's things that John saw in the ministry of Christ that nobody else saw that he writes about. Um, and then, of course... You have this vision, these visions that he's going to be shown, what the angel's going to communicate to him. Um, And so John is is really privileged, uh, blessed um, to to receive all of this. And so uh, getting back to our question, is this the end of the world that we're going in? Well, we're certainly, you know, a day closer to the end of the world than we were yesterday, but it's not the end of the world. There needs to take place certain events in the book of Revelation, according to what the angel Gabriel communicated to John, the visions that God wanted him to see for it to be the end of the world. So tomorrow is not the end of the world. Listen, the rapture could happen tomorrow, and then we would be in a time period here. And so let me just speak to that very quickly. Um, This is what uh, we believe um, in terms of uh, the end time prophecies timeline. And again, we'll go into a lot more detail um, in the days and weeks to come. Uh, but we believe in a rapture. We believe that uh, God will take his church out of the world um, and believers will be spared of the wrath that God is going to pour out on the earth. You know, let me just be candid with you and say that um, when I first started reading the book of Revelation years ago, um, there were times where I go, I can't believe this is going to happen. I can't, I'm reading, I can't believe this is going to happen. Uh, you know, why would this happen? And you know, the older I've gotten, uh, the more I've realized just how evil this world is and how people really are hell bent on doing terrible things. I mean, you could just stop at children and the things that are done with children, the trading of children as sex slaves. You could just stop right there, that there's a whole enterprise of that. And of course, now, you know, as we get older, we realize, you know what? What do we say? Come, Lord Jesus, come. 
Come quickly, Lord Jesus. How evil this world is from the world leaders uh, to, to people who are operating behind the scenes and, of course, the demons. Uh, come, Lord Jesus, come. And so we believe in a rapture. And that's a beautiful thing where God will take his church out of the world. So as a believer, you're going to go to heaven one of two ways. Uh, either you're going you're gonna to die, your life is going to end on here on this earth, and the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Or the rapture could happen in our lifetime and we could be taken up to heaven. And these are, are truths that we hold on to. Now, the Bible makes clear as you begin to study and you put this together that after the rapture happens, that's when the seven-year point of tribulation will take place. Now, some people, uh, you would call that maybe like a pre-tribulation belief. Some people have a mid-tribulation belief that right in the middle of the seven years of, of uh, tribulation, uh, that's when the believers will be taken up right before the Antichrist really gets evil. He, he's rising the power, but in the last three and a half years, according to the prophecy in the book of Revelation, he, he just, you know, he, he goes outright assault on the church. That's known as the Great Tribulation. Um, and so that's when the church gets taken up. Uh, some people hold to that view, which is fine. And then some people have, you know, a post-tribulation where he's going to take the church at the end. Um, I, listen, I'm going for the pre-trib, okay? I think that's much better. As I said before, you've heard me jokingly say, you know, you might want to call yourself a pantheologist. However it pans out, you're going to go with God. But I truly believe as we look at this, and we'll dive into deeper these facts when we get to uh, the church of uh, Philadelphia where it talks about uh, Jesus sparing. But um, I believe that we have this rapture uh, to look forward to, and we should be praying for the Lord uh, to usher in these events. And so you have the rapture, you have the seven years of tribulation, the first three and a half years uh, will not be good. Chaos will begin to unfold on the earth. Um, the Antichrist will begin to rise to power, but it's that last three and a half years where literally uh, hell on earth begins to take place. And then, of course, you have, um, you have that, the beautiful second coming of Christ. You have the thousand-year reign, and, and you begin to put all of this together, and you see uh, this being revealed. And, uh, you know, these, these truths, these mysteries, um, really unfolding before our eyes. And so as believers, we could take hope in that. And so is this the end of the world, COVID-19? I know it might feel that way. It's not. Um, this is a, a terrible pandemic that we're going through. Are there people that are going to uh, sinisterly profit from this? There already are. There's people scamming people of bank accounts and medical information. I mean, it just, it just never ends. This world is so evil. And then, of course, is big government involved? And is this person involved with a vaccine? And is this did this person cause it? And all these things could begin to get your mind going. And, you know, you feel like a hamster in a maze or something like that. You don't want to go there. Um, God has it under control. That's where our faith needs to be. And we want to frame COVID-19 and anything else that comes our way in our lifetime through the lens of the book of Revelation, that God is in control, that God may allow things to take place, but God is greater. And if Christ could defeat the demons, the Antichrist, and the devil all in one shot, he could defeat whatever it is that we are going through. And so I think uh, as you begin to look at the book of Revelation, it would be a, a, a tremendous oversight if you didn't realize that not only is it something uh, to, to, for us to digest, uh, but it's something for us to apply to our lives. And we know that by this first blessed statement, one of seven, by the way, uh, perhaps a future sermon series, the seven blessed are you statements in uh, the book of Revelation. But verse three says, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. That's how important this is. You know, let me just tell you this. Read this to your children. Read this to your, your, your children's children. Read it to families. You know, hey, we're going we're gonna to read the book of Revelation in our house. Um, you know, people go, oh, I can't believe we're going to read this. Do you realize the garbage that some people watch in their home? The TV that they watch, the movies that they allow their children to watch, the video games they allow their children to play? Uh, the book of Revelation will be a comfort. Um, listen, if you don't want to go uh, too into detail into the judgments, at least read the first chapter. But blessed is the one who reads aloud. So it's good to read the scripture aloud uh, of this prophecy. And you want to underline that right there, prophecy, because John wrote this, and these are things to come. And so the book of Revelation, although it's a New Testament book, it is a prophetic book. All 404 verses are prophetic. 
Again, as we mentioned earlier, 278 of those 404 are alluding to or referring to Old Testament prophecy. And so if you like prophecy, this is a mega book to study, as we like to say. And so whoever reads these words, words aloud, prophes, uh, you know, these prophecies, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now, again, the time is near is speaking of how these things will rapidly unfold. Not that now it's going to happen tomorrow, um, but the, the time is near that it's when these things happen, they will happen one after another in succession, the events that are listed and labeled here. So blessed are those. So is this the end of the world? No, it's not. But we can have hope that God has the end of the world under control. And if he has the end of the world under control, then we could trust that he has our lives here on this earth under control. Again, the book of Revelation, the gospels revealed the humiliation of Christ going to the cross. The book of Revelation reveals the honor of Jesus Christ, the strength of Jesus Christ, the majesty of Jesus Christ, how he will defeat Satan once and for all. And that should give every believer that is hearing this and watching this great hope that the prophecies of the scripture make very clear that we are overcomers. And so you know what that means right now? You know how you can apply that to your life right now? Don't walk around defeated. Stop thinking this is how it's always going to be. No, in Jesus Christ, you are more than a conqueror. Uh, God is in control of all these things right now. And yes, there's great reason to be concerned. Uh, that, that's called being responsible. But you don't need to be controlled by fear. That's something different. We know how it's going to work out. We know uh, that, that we know that God is going to win. We know that Jesus is going to win. There's no reason for us to fear uh, what is going on. And so whether the government or outside forces or whoever is trying to manipulate, don't get caught up in that. Focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Focus on the fact that uh, at when the end does unfold, God will know exactly when that is. It's not for us to be concerned about the calendar. It's for us to be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. As I close, um, I'm reminded of the church of Thessalonian. Um, the church at Thessalonica, they, they actually were concerned, some of the believers, that they missed the rapture. Um, they were concerned that they, that they were missing out. And, you know, Paul really, part and parcel, the apostle Paul who wrote to the church of Thessalonica was really reminding them, no, just live for Christ. Just live for the glory of Christ. And if the book of Revelation does anything for you and I, it straightens us out to live for the glory of Jesus Christ, to pursue his holiness, to stop wasting time and playing games. And whether it is this pandemic or another one or a crisis, whatever it might be, we are going to remain focused on trusting in the Lord God Almighty. We remember the words of Jesus in John's gospel as well. Um, remember what John recorded it? Jesus said, Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And not only has he overcome the world, he has overcome the underworld, hell. And with those two areas beat, there is nothing that you can't get through in this life. And so glory be to God for the revelation, for the revelation of Jesus Christ. And glory be to God that it is going to unfold with certainty. Every line, every sentence, and God wants us to have complete trust in his son, Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the events that are to come. Lord, these events are meant to scare us. They're meant to give us hope, especially now in these times of uncertainty. What we do know is certain is your revealed plan, your love, your mercy, your forgiveness, your justice, your wrath, your redemption. And Lord God, your reign forever and ever. And so we thank you, O oh God. And Lord God, we will not be fearful, Lord, if this is the end of the world. We know that you hold the world in the palm of your hand. And so God, we give you all the praise and glory that you are due. And we sow these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.